Alrighty, uh, so I got involved with Project Drawdown. Paul Hawkins started this. It's a new book where they're trying to look at uh, ways to reduce global warming. Uh, the IPCC report, which some of you may be familiar with, focuses on all the negative side effects. So this is trying to look at solutions. So they came up with a long list of solutions, uh, over 100. Uh, they have people over the world looking at this with different fellowships. And it first started with, uh, for the building specific, with the uh, Living Building uh, Program. But uh, it was shown that there aren't enough projects going after the Living Building Challenge, so Net Zero is chosen as the next solution. So why does it matter? Like this chart looks at uh, amount of fossil fuel consumption from zero to the future, you can see this massive spike in consumption. So not only do we have too many emissions uh, getting pumped in the atmosphere, but we also are running out of fuel. Uh, mandatory versus voluntary. So I've noticed as a theme in my research that that's one of the main issues, is that uh, some countries are using the carrot and others are using the stick. And we're having different outcomes based on those cultural targets especially compared to Europe. So in North America, uh, the AA2030 challenge is one of the big goals. You can see uh, 60, 70, 80, 90% uh, reductions up till 2030. Uh, and it's been amazing to be in practice. I, when this first came out, I was really excited about it. I was hoping lots of projects would adopt it, but in practice, hardly any projects have been adopting this. So this is data from the re most recent AIA 2030 uh, report. Uh, in 2010 through 2014, only you know, 10 to 12 percent of projects have been hitting the 60 percent reduction target, uh, let alone the 7 percent reduction target. It's much more challenging. So net zero buildings, it's kind of this ideal target that we have. Um, but in reality, most projects are still kind of running after more power and aren't generating enough power on site. So the question is, what do we have to do to change that? And as a culture, how do we draft things to incentivize people? Uh, so then it's, what is net zero? Uh, there's net zero costs. California has defined that in their net zero definition, which confuses everybody. Net zero energy site is the one most people are familiar with. There's net zero energy source, which is what Europe's using uh, in a lot of regards. And net zero carbon, which is uh, kind of one of the newest metrics. Uh, for me, net zero carbon should be the target. A good quote from Lord Calvin, if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. And I've seen a number of projects where if we're only measuring uh, energy use or energy costs, you don't see the whole picture, and your emissions can be much higher than you would expect. Uh, so I had to look at how different countries all over the world are adopting net zero energy. Uh, North America right now, there's um, under 4,000 buildings that have hit that. Which if you think about how many projects there are in the country, it's a tiny drop in the bucket. Europe, however, by 2020, they're mandating that almost all projects are almost net zero. So in the modeling I had to do as part of this fellowship, uh, the blue line is the expected building energy uh, growth. The gray line is based on our current adoption rate, how well we're doing. Uh, so that's based on AI data and other adoption rates. The orange line is what the 23 challenge is supposed to do. So in Europe, uh, you can see a number of countries here that have um, the uh, energy performance certificates. That's one of the big things where you have full disclosure of how buildings are forming. It's kind of like a report card for buildings. Uh, that's something we really should implement here. Seattle's trying to do that to some extent, but it's kind of a watered down version of what's happening in Europe. Uh, you can see by uh, 2020, all new uh, buildings are supposed to be net almost net zero or near net zero in Europe. Um, and it's kind of amazing how, how much farther they're pushing it compared to in North America at the moment. Uh, if you look at uh, Belgium in particular, uh, Zach's going to talk about this as well, uh, there is a, a massive adoption and they're looking at Passive House. And that's been probably the main thing Europe's using to try to hit these targets. And here, it's still relatively new. Uh, so Passive House, we have a number of presentations tonight on that. So if you guys haven't seen presentations on Passive House before, uh, you'll see some more details on it. But the principles are a low cost improvement. And it's probably about the lowest cost option you have for most housing, especially residential, which when I had to look at these net zero buildings, the majority of buildings in the world are residential. 
Um, and so in Europe, they're using the stick. It's happening through the code authorities. And so this is from the European Commission. Different countries are adopting it in different ways, and it's a little um, unbalanced with how strong the stick is. So like if you're in Denmark, they have a very strong stick. If you're in Greece, it's not as strong as a stick. So it kind of depends on what country you're in. Um, and it also relates to, in Europe, one of the fascinating things is population. So I had to look at these emission targets. There's this awkward relationship with population projections. So some countries have an inherent advantage because population is dropping whereas other countries' population is growing. And another part of that, uh, the Kigali Agreement, is something that was just uh, ratified looking at uh, having refrigerants in buildings, and it's banning HFC refrigerants, which is a massive change. And uh, if you look at emissions in terms of net zero emissions, that's a huge improvement on projects. So how to get to net positive uh, is part of the solutions, how to look at current technologies. So PV today, maximum get to about a seven-story building for a typical office project. Theoretical efficiencies, a little over 30%. Maybe you can get up uh, over 10 stories, but it's hard. And in Seattle, it's especially hard because energy is so cheap. So uh, for a typical uh, diet in America, 2,600 calories, uh, you could feed yourself if you could eat electricity on 22 cents a day. <laughs> so imagine trying to feed yourself on 22 cents a day. Even in San Diego or LA, it's still only about uh, half a dollar. So I'm just ending with this. We live in unusual times. This is from the French Revolution. <laughs> There's a lot of change happening. We need a revolution in the building industry, and uh, I encourage all of you to help make that happen. Thank you.